Well, thank you for joining me in this final part that is two parts that I'm trying to cover all in this one lesson. So I want you to know that it is going to be lengthy, so you need to get a pen and pad uh, for those who really care and want to try to take uh, their ministry to a new dimension and just learning some new things. Uh, I really think that what you may hear, then maybe you should be able to consider praying that God would be able to help you build bridges concerning what you hear, especially for leadership development, discipleship. So, Father, we thank you that that one that is listening, God, that they'll be reminded that we're nothing and can do nothing without you. And so I thank you, Father, for humility. I speak that over them today, that they will humble themselves and hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in Jesus' name. Well, God bless you for you know going on this journey with me for these uh, five critical eras, uh, like era, <laughs> areas, because a lot of them are eras, uh, areas that we do need to really focus on. So the first one that I went, so you want to go back and listen to those tapes, I talked about leadership development and discipleship, which we are way late in doing. The second one, I talked about vision, mission, and strategy, and the cultures that we constantly talk about culture, but I'm talking about cultures of faith and delivery in your faith. So vision, mission, strategy, and culture. And then on the third one, I talked about practicing uh, servant leadership. We have a lot of people who are serving themselves, and we need servanthood leadership. And in these teachings, I talked about, you know, different concepts concepts uh, for the equipping that I believe that God would have us to really look at. And remember, I always give my disclaimer, I don't believe that I've arrived on anything, and I pray that you don't have that mentality either, because we're growing every day from glory to glory. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm constantly asking God to equip me to know how to serve the least of them, and I pray you're doing the same. And most importantly, that we will look at some areas that we need to realize that, you know, our intellect and our titles are not going to get it. Uh, we need to be having ourselves endowed in the Spirit of God and the Word of God that we may move forward and build kingdom. So, as I said on the third one, uh, I gave you that. Then on the fourth one that I'm dealing with today, which will be uh, closing out, I'll be dealing with meetings and team building. Lord, that's a big one. And then number five, I'll be talking about uh, communication, uh, conflict, and criticism. We have a lot of those challenges that we don't pay attention to. So I'm going to set my timer, and I pray that you will take heed to what I am saying and, and understand that, as I said, I have not arrived at anything, but I believe that God looks down from heaven for those who will see God, according to Psalms 14 and 2, that says the Lord looks down from heaven, but on the sons of men, to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. And I pray that you will be the one who is seeking God in the midst of all the things that we're going through even now. As I always say, it's better to be forewarned so that we can make sure that we are forearmed in the times that we're in. Now, I also wanted to share about this particular lesson that's really important to me, so I want to give a reference from of the book of Titus chapter 2. Now, I believe God wants me to talk about that is because as far as leadership is concerned, many of us don't realize the real true issues that drive us on a daily basis for what we make decisions about. And, of course, I've always tried to get that analogy of there's over 35,000 decisions that we make in a day's time. But we need to look at what's shaping your decisions, what's shaping your emotions, what's driving you to do what God has called you to do or either to want to equip leadership and disciple those that God has put to your hand. So it's very important for us to pay attention. You know, in this pandemic, there's been so many spirits of silence and so much confusion, so much intense fear and fear of failure, you know, fear of getting COVID. We don't leave that out. And the lonely spirit, you know, we see so much fear that's even caused people to have infirmities in their mind. Okay, so we want to fast and pray and ask God to strengthen us. But these three areas that we flow out of, love, hate, or fear, is what's destroying so many leadership, uh, in the, in the, in the, first of all, in their movement of what God has called them to do, and in their spiritual realm where they feel, they're feeling very, very wounded. You know, I want you to say like this particular topic that I just wanted to share really quick with you. I think God is speaking, and I know that he is, and I think it's important that we pay a good attention to some things that many times that we overlook when God is trying to give us a little, little, uh, how they say, a little living in the area where he wants you to get strengthened in. And so I want you to say like this. It's an old ancient proverb that says, he who wants a rose, he who wants a rose, say it, to, say it out loud, he who wants a rose must respect the thorn. I'll say it again. He who wants a rose 
must respect the thorn. And what that is really trying to tell us is that you got to look at there's going to be some rough times, there's going to be some hardships that God is going to have us to go through, but many of those are for our own self-growth and development. But in this particular part, um, when I begin to talk about this, and I don't want to forget to bring this out, that when I finish these, these two right here, which is going to be a lengthy lesson, uh, I want you to make sure that you watch throughout starting in August all the way through the end of the year, I'll be doing a continuous series uh, on those who are in position and transition and, and God is showing you different things and some things seem to be delayed. And so I'll be talking about contending with delays versus God's timing, okay? I'll be talking about that series throughout the rest of the year that I believe that God is want. I know I want to look into it a little deeper to see what is holding up, what, what, no, what, what decision have I made, you know, out of these 35,000 that we get an opportunity that God give us each day. Where am I in my emotional fitness? I pray God to do that for you today. So let's jump into Timothy really quick. Um, you know, when you look at the book of Timothy, I think about Paul and how Paul really chose, you know, about the spirit, uh, the leadership qualities that need to be in an individual before they get to put them somewhere. And so there were several things that stood out to me in Titus. And I'm going to read a portion of it in a minute. But, you know, one of the things I think was really, really clear to Paul is that Titus was one that he knew that had, uh, how they say, the initiative to do something, who had uh, humility, who would follow the leader based on he, what he saw in the leader, you know, because many people are abusing power. Many people are very abusive with power. Many people are have uh, allowed themselves to become the idol God in the, in the, in the sheep's lives or, you know, the sheep has created an idol, you know, or there's a lot of spiritual adultery going on because they look unto the leader, meaning to the man or the hand of man, and not really looking at the God in the man or woman. And so we need to make sure that we follow that leadership, and then God will be able to keep you connected to the vine that he has chosen for you so that you can grow in that. Amen. And as I said, I have my eyes on everything, but I love Psalm 119 and 71. That is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And I have been in a lot of abuse of power. I have uh, abused power myself. Uh, and I think, think that because I am true to the word, and I am true to be able to be candid about myself, I believe this is where the anointing of humility and growth comes in my life as an apostle. And I pray that those who are listening to fivefold will be able to think on that thing. Think about where you know that you have not become broken or humbled at, that God may allow you to respect these particular places, these thorns, that God pretty much wants us to make sure that we realize that we have to have this respect for authority, and we also have to have the respect for ourselves to know that, you know, God has uh, positioned leaders to equip us. And, you know, in this book, Titus, in chapter uh, 3, you know, he even expresses about authority and submission. He talks about uh, how important for us to understand that responsibility for uh Community and uh, being equipped is going to uh, allow us to pay close attention to that person, that mentor, that coach, that pastor, that midwife that is trying to uh, mentor you or to coach you and prepare you most importantly, disciple you, it's everybody's responsibility. So but there are qualifications for that leadership. And so we're talking about that today in this challenge number four for equipping um, these uh, concepts for equipping that I'm going to go through really quick. I want you to think about this one first, number four. Uh, and team meetings and teams and building uh, and equipping. So what I wanted to bring out with Titus really quickly was, you know, he knew that uh, Paul knew that he had did his best to raise up Titus. He chose him well. He taught him well. And so the first part of this, as I said before, that many of us realize that Titus was first a trusted son of Paul. You know, he was trusted. That means the saving grace that was on his life that Paul had poured into him. And Titus became a very humble man. He became one that he could move according to what he was taught. He was not trying to be an equalizer. He was trying to make sure that he took those leadership qualifications and things that he was being shown to be able to, you know, to uh, have the authority to do the things that he was, you know, equipped to do or disciple to do, he humbled himself, okay? He was uh, some in this fashion somewhat, uh, how do they say, a king kingdom building, a trailblazer, you know? And so the second part of it I think was important for us to recognize and that he was a troubleshooter, okay? The bottom line is that he was there to make
make sure that he looked at decisions that he made, that he knew that those were also going to reflect uh, Paul, his equipping, uh, delivering to him. So that means that he wanted to make sure that he did what we try to do every day, please God, but make sure that we be an example of those that have poured into you. That's why I say a lot of times people think that you think that you're all that in a bag of chips or you won't give them this or you won't, you don't see where they are in a certain uh, dimension of their lives yet. And they figure, well, you don't tell me. I know what God told me. Well, God is a God of order, and he's going to make sure that we don't go outside of that uh, dimension of glory to glory. He wants to make sure that those who he put to our hand are going through some of these I'm going to share with you today. So Titus was a troubleshooter. He was one that got to the bottom line of an issue. He was there to to build up things. He was there to look at places that had trouble and try to make sure that those things get straightened out, okay? The third thing about Titus, he was a task-oriented specialist. That's what I like to say. Paul had sent him back to Corinth to confront some very messy situations and some of those opponents that was against Paul's teaching back then when you think about when he was in Crete, or Crete is what they say, and he needed to organize and establish these churches in that city. But, you know, one thing I like about Titus, the fourth thing, is that he was a teachable servant. Many of us are not teachable. This is the reason why God cannot pour in the fresh oil to give you more authority and more how they show more grace to do a thing or to be able to go into another position or to be able to see where he's taking you because of the lack of humility for servanthood leadership to make sure that you are looking at where am I needing to submit uh, to the authority that God has put uh, close to me or have allowed me to become uh, in a relationship with someone that I can really humble myself to be that servant leader to prove these gifts that God has put inside of me that I can prove those things in the, uh, you know, in the presence of the Lord that I can feel comfortable about that. And so if you read Titus chapter uh Right, chapter 2, which really, if I was you, I'd read the whole book. I made that was my choice uh, last month's chapter to read the entire book of Titus. It's a short book, but I think it's important, it's, and it's taking a lot of power for us to see where we are as far as leadership is where we are now, because churches are not open the way they used to be, uh, where we can go to church on Wednesdays and Sundays and things like that. So many people are doing virtual church. And so we've got to be able to reach the population, especially those that are in leadership. This is why I was led to do this. Uh, this series on the challenges that we face as far as equipping the leaders and discipling people, I think it's very important. So here we go. Here's number four. I pray, I pray I gave what those things, I got notes all around me, trying to be sure that I give this search, I mean, this last 25 minutes, I pray it'll work, uh, of what I need to share with you concerning decision-making and meetings and things like that. So there's an area, you get your pen, let's get started. There's an area in every leader's life that we need to improve to uh, allow us to uh, impregnate by the Spirit so that we can help build them up and have a teamster spirit. So our goal in meetings and things like that, that first of all, we got to recognize the connection, those that God has put to our hands. We need to look at the meeting types that we're hosting. When we bring uh, even new converts into meetings that you feel that they're equipped to build up or do a certain thing, you know, we didn't make sure that we are looking at our meeting team building, okay? We want to make sure that things are done right and according to the vision that God has given us as a leader or a mentor or a coach for that individual individual uh, in your life. So it's very important, especially those who are pushing babies out like myself as a midwife in the apostolic all of my life, I believe in teamster spirit. I believe that we need to make sure that purpose is being driven and pushed out according to God's timing so that the baby won't come out uh, looking the wrong way or trying to do something they do not have that grace for. And so very important that we look at a few points here that we continue to build insight, build strength, and, and reduce as much conflict as possible as we're trying to raise that leader up or disciple that individual who may have been church hopping or may have had a lot of hurts and, and you know, and then they're watching you to see when you're going to act like the old person that, that was, you know, leading them. And so many a times they'll just uh, put you with that face of that, under, put that face of that individual who have wounded them or that they were hurt by 
how they felt that they was holding them back in their call to ministry. So we got to be very, very careful when we're meeting. The first concept, the equipping concept I want to talk about, number one, is a leader must keep tabs on his or her people's spiritual strength, okay? That's what I'm talking about, to make sure they're humble so the accomplishments can come out and so that we won't have an equalizer spirit, so that we won't have a spirit that's causing us that feel like that, oh, I already know that, or oh, I got that, you know, oh, I, because we can know the scripture all we want, and I always try to remind us all, and myself, the devil know the word too. And in this last day, he is coming in as a spirit of light. You know, just read Jude. Jude is telling us how he's creeping into the church, you know, and, and those people who are asleep, sleep. And, and, and looking at the devil talking to you with a collar on, and you can't even discern that. And so we can't, Numbers 13 and 31 tells us we can't go up, go up against the people because they are stronger than we are. And that means because Caleb had his work cut out for him to convince his brothers otherwise that we can. This entire story in Numbers is telling us, it's too long to tell in this particular little session here, but it's telling us but the effects of the people, the fears that they had to be led in distrust, these things like that. And then the ultimate issue is that they had a bitter rebellion, uh, rebellion against God. And first of all, for those that are leading us, we need to make sure that we uh, make our choices to decide that I know that this person is trying to equip me and not trying to harm me. And so many people have fear of failure, a fear of rejection, or feel rejected. And so how is it that your morale in your church, or how is it that your morale, let me see if I said this time, you know, I didn't, I guess I did, okay. So anyway, this concept you know, we didn't look at where is the criticism? You know, where where are these things that people are lacking to do? Are they celebrating? Or are they just there to hate? You know, are they just there to spy? Or are they just there to see whether or not you're going to let them preach or teach or, you know, or, or are you going to credential them? We need to look at where is the heartbeat of those that have been put to your hand and why are they there? Uh, I think that we need to spend some time, some personal time with those beyond that welcoming meeting that we have uh, once we get all the new converts there. Uh, they've been baptized and all of that. Well, we got to remember this is a soul, and many things in the soulish realm have to be dealt with. And so we want to look at those undercurrent types of uh, criticism and things like that that each person is so easy to bring out. The concept number two for equipping on this topic is at times people need to be reminded to focus on the basics, okay? Let's stay in the lane where we are. We need to get uh, people to look at each other uh, and what we are doing and even in a group. Are we gossiping? Are we arguing? Are we wasting time? You know, is a leader uh, responsible to correct these particular bad habits and when. This is very important so we can recognize in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 10, I'm only going to get part of that in the NIV, it says, yet we uh, urge you to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. See, in these verses, Paul exhorts the, the theologians, I'm sorry, the Thessalonians, who were believers, to get to work and quit spending their energy or, you know, on these endeavors or these things that are breaking down the unity, that is destroying the purpose-driven thing that the leader has given us to do based on what we believe, or we wouldn't be there, that God has chosen that leader, chosen that midwife in your life, chosen that pastor, chosen whoever it is, that mentor, that coach, that you now need to understand that you're grumbling, you're complaining, and you know, oh, this ain't enough, and I don't know why I haven't got that yet, because you want to go ahead of God. I don't want to preach. And so the concept number three is to purge anything in your meeting of emotional conflict, okay, when you're meeting. Uh, but you need to be able to encourage healthy debate. You know, some things, it may not sound right, and people are not in agreement with you, but we need to hear some of these areas that maybe God is trying to ring your bell on the least of them, but those who may not have a, a, a title or a credential. I think it's very important that we pay attention because some of those people that are there that may be sent there want to show you some things that need to come up in your life. You know, there's simple things. You know, the God has sent me to churches, and I was, I was in one church, and I remember, you know, just sitting there, and, and I'm not going to call no name because they already know who it is because they are packing power and anointed to teach and preach. But I went there for a whole month. I sit there. And I was wondering, when are they going to do an altar call? I don't want to preach. 
And so as I began to think on that, I said, my God, you know, in this meeting, in this time that we've come together, you know, we need to make an, an, an excessive type of an attempt to either uh, get someone to give us a memory, uh, uh, you know, uh, a reminder to don't forget that, because we can be under the anointing so that, you know, we we know how you remember calling out, and we just praying, and people coming getting hands laid on them and everything, but ain't no souls coming to Christ. Ain't no repentance coming for their saving grace. And so we need to look at that. So what I did, I didn't just, you know, watch it. I waited until God told me to release the information in private with this leader that you need to remember to put your little card. So I didn't just tell him. I created a little card that I put on the altar so that he would remember, do the altar call. When he's closing out, then he remember, oh, my God. And he just, he was very humble, and he said, thank you, Dr. Murphy. You know, I didn't realize that. I said, yeah, well, you know, I'm sitting out here. Uh, I'm not trying to critique you as though I've arrived, but I'm just letting you know, uh, we got a lot of people in here I can see that really want to come. I said, I guarantee you, when you open it out, it's going to be full because they are moved by Holy Spirit of what you're teaching. And so we want to grab the soul when, they, when they're ready and right. So there it was, and he said yes. And see, he saw how those numbers increase in the church because many of us are lacking uh, taking that opportunity in our meetings. And if you're not going to do it, then have somebody assigned to do that, to do the altar call. Amen. And so let me jump back on. So anyway, the best way to prevent the division, to manage conflict closer, you've got to watch for the individual that tend to strive on stirring this pot up of backbiting and gossip and all those things. Proverbs 29 and 22 tells us an angry man stirs up dissension, and a hot-tempered one commits many sins. Now, <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm probably reading out of the American Standard Version, so a different version, so you can do your Google and see based on what I've said uh, where they're coming from. Because some of these I don't have in my notes. I didn't put it in there. But let's talk about the frontline leaders, okay? When we're meeting and stuff like that, let's talk about that from a biblical perspective. Some keys I want to give you really quick about how to better your meeting, how to spend time. I am a tickler on time. Uh, because time is very important, because we don't want to lose a soul, and we don't want to not give what we need to give out. That's why I told you from the very beginning this message is going to be kind of lengthy, because I got two different sessions to get done today was my goal, that I need to get it done because I'm behind on that. So anyway, these biblical keys to better this meeting and to equip your team, I'm going to give you these five particular basic uh, meetings uh, strategies. So the first one, uh, you need to have your meetings uh, to be led by a leader who does it best, okay? So, for instance, if you're not the one that's going to be talking in the meeting, you want to pick someone, um, particularly in your business or in your ministry, and you want people who are there to get people in a position to ask questions, to learn how to think on their feet. These are the type of people who you want to lead that meeting, who know how to get the conversations done, who know how to point to it and be on time, who knows how to get these uh, areas of defense uh, or of oppression type of mentality people, how to love that out of them and how to recognize these uh, equipped, not equipped, these qualities that are coming out of the leadership that you can coach them and now you can lead them and teach them how to be an example when maybe that one that you see is best fit can't do it. So we've got to constantly be creating disciples and positioning people to grow. Number two, you want to share the scripture about unity, okay, and then share a practical uh, point that you want them to do, especially in a church. This is a good way to get most of the senior leaders that you see that are elders to get involved. So you want to explain your group conducts in the meeting. You know, you want to have a loving and healthy family group meeting or whenever there's something to do. You want to make sure, according to scripture, that they understand that, and it's not by you as a little God to them, but you're giving them what the Word of God is saying. You may need to remind those that are in attendance, you know, at this meeting, at every meeting, you may need to bring that out. You know, it's a great opportunity to share and let others catch on to this type of vision, this type of delivery that God has put in your belly so we can create order and have, you know, kingdom building to be in process. Then number three, and you want to ask every attendee in the meeting to make their comments, especially uh, with honor and toward their colleagues. Many times we don't give 
uh, honor or represent those that are in the midst that have been serving us. So we want to respectively honor those who are serving, who are respectfully give kudos to those who went out of their way to do something extra. And so we want to, and those that are in attendance, we need to make sure we know we wouldn't even have a church or anything without Holy Spirit bringing them there. So we want to make sure we recognize to make sure that those who may be acting like bullies or those who may be acting ungodly, that people who are, you know, who are opposing, uh, coming against uh, the leaders with different type of uh, enemy uh, situations in their lives, and then they want to bounce it onto the leaders or those among the group, we need to make sure that we expose those because we are a family. We want to make sure that we pull that down and make sure in love that we do that, that we're not going to have that because we are a family and we're unified. And so you will be respected for this action, trust me, because they see that you're not trying to hide their nakedness. We want to open it up as God leads for those things that we know that we need to open up as a unified force and in an army that we've got to be on the same page. Amen. So one tiny rebuke, we need to remember, might change the entire culture of your meeting forever. And so you want to make sure that you do that tiny rebuke as a group, okay? Because remember, if we're in the midst and that thing uh, gets in one spiritual infection, it is going to grow. And it begins to grow and grow until the main people who you thought was going to support you is now coming against you. Number four. You want to give people a written agenda. This is one of the hardest things. Give them a written agenda so they know what's going on. So the agenda is very important because many times people don't know why they're there, what the meeting is for. Most people are like horses, okay? They don't like to be spooked. <laughs> they, they want to know up front that you're going to call me to do something, you know, that you're going to ask me to lead something. So, But we need to be prepared. Now, we know some things that people need to be ready, as the Bible tells us, to be instant in season and out of season. We need to be prepared. But we all also need to get people who are babies uh, in the ministry to not have a spirit of fear of failure. And, and I'm not saying fear in the sense that they, that they, you know, let the devil take over them, but people want to be able to demonstrate wisely and effectively. So we want to give them time. We want to set the agenda. We want to make sure the meeting has value, you know, so things that we waste time with won't be uh, in the way. You want to have a, this trusted type of flavor in the ministry so that people can see that they can trust what you are saying and that you're consistent about what you're saying and doing. And then number five, open and close the meeting with prayer. You know, it's, we can get so busy sometimes. Sometimes I do the same thing here. You know, I try to remember to pray, and sometimes I pray before, and sometimes I may not. But uh, this is a classroom, so you do understand that I'm trying to give you some keys here. Like I said, not as I've arrived, but I think I have been so well. I believe that over these, I'm going to be 66. No, I'm going to be 67 this year, okay. Six or seven years old and have been doing ministry for almost 50 years. I really believe that God has equipped me and I've been some places. So I believe that to God be the glory, that now we need to be able to pour that back out because, like I always say, I'm not going to leave here full with the anointing. I want to impregnate as many who will allow the seeds that God has put inside of me to plant inside of them who are humble, who want to learn, who is desperate to know how to get that baby out and grow and go. Number five. Open and close the meeting with prayers, what I just said, you know, as much as possible. You need to consider the open and closing time. You know, you need to think about uh, just a, a short prayer can send much power. We ain't got to be doing these long prayers, okay? So now I want to give you eight tips for the, developing this workplace culture type of mentality to better your team. Okay, number one, first of all, you need to learn from your history. That's what I just got done saying. I can't give you something I have never done, and I can't have uh, been there. I need to give you something. I need to make sure you know, just like I can't tell you what it feels like to have a baby and you ain't never been pregnant. I want to make sure you understand and learn from your history. That's what you want to do. It's time for us to look at both the successes and failures of our past. Let them know what you made a mistake about, uh, you made a bad decision about. You are a team, and we have not arrived, okay? And, you know, and, and that, it, that this is not just a learning from them, but now you are moving forward in that learning process, okay? So from this past success, uh, even though you had a success in one area, doesn't mean that the future uh, success is going to be there. I don't care how much you fast. I don't care how much you pray. Some things is God's timing. That's why I'm going to go over that uh, type of uh, series that's coming up. 
We want to build foundation, just as Paul uh, talked about his struggles and all of that. We want to remember that these past failures can give us value, can give us a valuable perspective so that we can deliver that out better. In 1 Corinthians 10 and in verse 11, it says, Now these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instructions on whom the end of the ages has come. And this is where I'm at. I'm pouring it out, okay? The second thing is to find people that complement your personality. This is a big one. Okay, so the core values that you bring to the table should be the driving force behind the people you bring into your ministry or your business, all right? So if you have a core value of respect, then why would you consider someone who speaks all this kind of gross stuff or who don't have uh, that type of mentality or that type of flavor of unity and growth for discipleship in them to others, okay? So the Bible tells us, Proverbs 27 and 17, Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. You know, and one man will sharpen another if they really humble themselves. And number three, we're going to communicate well with your team. You know, uh, people say, I'm always holding meetings. I'm always holding orientations. I'm going to do that. Why? Because I'm going to let you sign off on something that you say you heard or that you understood. Many times we bring people into our vision or we give them the right hand of fellowship. We bring them into the church and we have our little coffee and cookie gathering where we welcome them in. But remember, we have to communicate well our vision to those, you know, communicate well with your team, well with those that are following you. And then as you do this, you're developing your culture. You're developing your vision in that individual or your business. So successful companies and organizations, nonprofits, and people who uh, do not allow this thing to come alive, many times uh, they're thriving on an open and honest communication, but many people don't spend the time to sit down to really get them to understand and communicate where I'm headed and what I'm trying to get done now, okay? People need to be able to share their ideas and speak openly without fear or maybe anything they have fear of failure or fear of retribution about what they want to say. Your team wants to be heard, okay? They want to know that they are respected for their opinions. And even though we may not want to grab a hold of that and we need to be mature in something that we need to correct when they're communicating to us, we need to do that in private. Some things need to be done in private so they don't have to be done in public. Number four, be a fun and peaceful and fruitful environment for where you're allowing people to come into work or serve you in your church. You need to engage your team in activities that make the work seem like it's not work. It's just the glory of God going forth as my brother and my sister, my pastors, my leaders, those people who are midwifing me or coaching me or mentoring, whatever that may be, that it will look good different in every business, in every organization, in every leader or any person that's been put to your hand. But there are ways to have fun in every situation. There are ways to be humorous, you know, or to show things. And even in error, we can laugh about. You know, I talk, uh, I laugh and kid around with a lot of those who are under my leadership or, that, or my son or daughter in ministry. But business is business when I'm in business. And I will joke about things sometimes, but I will let you know straight up when I'm very serious about a matter. You know, we need to make sure that we have fun and make sure people know how to understand where you are as far as making sure that there's fruit going forth in the place of the ministry or the business. So do something that is out of the norm, okay? Do something funny. Do something that all of a sudden they can say, I don't know what's wrong. Dr. Murphy, she was crazy talking. How is she doing that? That is so funny. So you want to give your team or your leaders and the opportunity to relax and to grow up in you to see that you're not just walking around with a, a, a robe all day long and a collar around your neck and a halo and wings in your back. I don't want to preach. You want to make sure that we can understand. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 in uh, verse 24 it tells us that there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. That means do what you know is bringing peace. Do that you know that is fruitful, okay? Then number five, be a team. All right, be a team. It's always a question that people say, you work for me, or this is my employee, or this is my son or daughter in the ministry, you know, we know where we are and we're mature enough to know. Some of us don't know where we are. We just went somewhere that God ain't sent you to be. But
but God is talking to you constantly when you in a group meeting or, or become a part of a team. This is why I tell people all the time, don't just go to church looking to see how they're going to use your gift. Sit down so the person who see you humbling yourself to being still, regardless of your title, you know, where you are in the fivefold or anything that you, you've gained in the secular realm. This goes the same in business. Why are you trying to make business right away with someone if you have not learned of their spirit? You have not seen their teamster spirit yet to be a team member. I want to praise. But this is something that everybody needs to do. Everyone is a part of the same team. So if you unify, you know, under this fact that you are all in the same, uh, how do you say, lump or in the same place that you believe in the vision and the leader, that you that you have come together, it will build a tighter culture. It will build a more powerful uh, build up of for discipleship and ministry growth because you are giving this cohesiveness to the team. Okay, number six. Lord, my time is really winding down. I haven't even got to part two. I mean, number five. We want to attend the garden. Very important so the fruit can grow. Okay, culture is not just a one and done thing. Okay, one. That one, that's all who get to do this. I believe in making sure that we have everybody to be multi-cross trained. This way, if Brother So-and-so can't be there, this one has also been alongside of them. I call it in reach and training within. That means now the culture is uh, one and not, not just one and done, and that's all it is to it. It takes time to tend and grow it. It takes time to spend. That's why you have to choose your leadership that's leading those in discipleship that you have put in charge of a team, that they are following the fruit that God has given you to grow to, uh, to uh, tend this garden, okay, that type of fruit. So it needs to be nurtured. It also needs to evolve. Don't just get them nurtured. They ain't doing nothing, okay? Get them to grow up so they can go. They can't stay with your leader the whole time. Otherwise, they wouldn't be going you there for it, as the Lord has uh, commanded us to do. We need to make sure they get off of those pews and don't just be pure, uh, pew warmers and you can see the gift in them. Stir it up so they can get this baby to grow. This evolution cannot be driven simply from the top down. It needs to be built from all ranks within this business, this organization, and this church. We need to evaluate your people, you know, on the core values of your ministry, of your vision. Not only their production that they're doing or serving you, you want to evaluate them. You want to see what are they doing and how are they serving. Number five, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping on challenge number five. I'm trying to get out of here. I know I'm going fast, but I'm trying to make sure that those who have an ear to hear will hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Amen. And so just rewind back and forth so you can hear what the Spirit of the Lord has said here. So number five challenge, I'm jumping on it right now because I'm already down to my last minute of the 25 that I put. But challenge number five, you know, I think we need to, this is one of the biggest ones is communication, you know, and conflict and criticism. So I want to go ahead and read Titus, like I said I would, uh, chapter two, I'm sorry, chapter three. I think it's Titus chapter three. Yeah, it's chapter three. I wanted to read this, but uh, I don't know how long this is going to read it. But uh, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, that's talking about leadership, to be ready to every good work, okay? To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Verse 3, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Mm. I was like that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, I once was there. Glory to God for deliverance. And number four. But after that, there's my turn on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, I'm say it again. Oh, I get out of here. But after that, the kindness, the love of God, our Savior toward uh, man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Verse 6, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of of eternal life. Verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, my God, that means to emphasize it, to put great emphasis on, to, to affirm 
constantly than me and confidently, okay, to make sure that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Verse 9, but avoid foolishness. Now, here it is. Some of you got people now that you that are totally tearing the church apart, and we got them going through there with lust and everything else, and we still put them in leadership and letting them do things that God is allowing you to get this thing straight. And so now this foolishness has caused a lot of division, has caused a lot of tension to the ministry because you feel like they do it so good, you want to keep them. Let me go on on verse nine. He said, "Boy, foolish questions and genealogy, genealogies. I can't even say that genealogies." and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Verse 10, a man that is an heretic. Now, here it is. After the first and second admonition, reject. Okay, that means you're warning them to stop it. You know, and I haven't even, I think I did some years ago a teaching on when you need to know that you need to, you know, get people to uh, leave the church, you know. Uh, we need to talk about that, but this scripture gives you evidence that it's necessary when people become a heretic or those people who want to usurp authority. And verse 11 says, knowing that he, knowing that he, that is such a subverted, that means perverted, and sinned, being condemned of himself. Verse 12, when I shall send Aratimus unto thee of Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, for I have determined there to winter. Bring Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their journey, diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. That means nothing going to be needed. And let, ours, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. In verse 15, all that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Now, in this part, in this communication and conflict, many of us have a lot of grumbling and complaining coming out of our own mouths. And so from the head down, it flows. Uh, the communication is fragmented, or you give people little quick things to say or do, and you don't give them full understanding of what you're expecting to them, for them to do. This is a great challenge. This is this, this, this particular challenge, uh, these three in this number five, you know, is causing a lot in the church today. It's causing a lot even in families today, the lack of communication in marriage, the lack of, you know, getting conflict resolution demonstrated, you know, in love, you know, in criticism in love. We, you know, we can criticize, but we need to make sure that we are fruitfully sharing what could be better, not just saying, oh, that, you know, so whether you find it chronically uh, bad in your ministry or your church, whether you find that conflict isn't there and you want to go, or you don't want to lead. So, and where conflict flourishes, criticism becomes a norm. So we need to make sure that we didn't look at when conflict is just going everywhere, and criticism is going to come anyway. Because first of all, we ain't dealt with the communication that's lacking, so the conflict is there, okay? And so criticism is going to come. See, communication breaks down even when everyone becomes critical and defensive, and then more conflict flares up because we haven't dealt with the lack of communication about the problem. And so we need to think about when this cycle continues, this culture of this type of mentality within a body, you know, it swirls right on up and down. Sometimes even the leader will deal with, I mean, that will go along with the lack of communication and conflict and, and, and all the criticism. And before you know it, they say, oh, you're on their side. But we need to make sure how are you handling criticism. You know, many people try to ignore it. Others listen to it closely. So it's wise to consider the, the, critic, the critical points that's going across. So we need to make sure that we can derive whatever value that you can hear from it or see from it or the individual. And then you need to move on. And you can't move on if it's in this place where you're dwelling on the criticism and, and allowing it to fester from the inside out, then people don't want to come into that kind of ministry. They don't want to come in and, and under that type of leadership. So this festering effect that we see here that Timothy is talking about, you know, that we need to know when we need to remove them out. The Bible is giving you some understanding on when to remove them. When you You've given them more than one correction, one in private, and then you try to gently talk to them in a group as a family. You know, and, and, and everything begins in the house, okay? So the first uh, equipment concept I want to give you is when you build up your critics, they tend to put you down less. 
So that means you're trying to get to see what is really going on. When you think about Gideon, how he defeated this large army, and this in the power of the Lord, it was nothing but God. But when confronted by some of his, how they say, his tribal, those people who we believe is in our group, these leaders that had missed the glory of his main battle principle, he did not quell those complaints or, or their desire to share in the victory. What he did is Gideon knew all they wanted was to save face and be included in the victory. We don't want to just try to get all glory to ourselves as though we've done all this alone. So he raised up their own accomplishments, is what he did, in one of the smartest ways and their criticism. He made sure, as Judges 8 and 3 is telling us, what was I able to do compared to you? When he said this is their anger against him subsided. We need to see that when you looking as though that you're agreeing to get along with something, God is trying to show you that we're kindling something that's a lot more better with the fruit of gentleness and love and peace and all of that to be able to get the person to hear you out about what's not where you are going or headed or what you meant. That is not what you mean. You want to make sure that it is clear that they don't have all this grumbling and complaining and not have this uh, communication where uh, that's fragmented, that's causing conflict. Concept number two for equipment in this lesson, number five, is the only uh, good kind of conflict has love mixed in, as I said before. Like a loving parent, you know, who at all times we're there to try to make sure this bad behavior with our children is corrected through discipline. Leaders need to do and, and be the same thing. Here's a, your reminder. We need to emulate how this compassion of God has given us a way to escape these things every day. He gives us grace and mercy every day. But that doesn't mean you want to keep having people waddling and vomit of, you know, of sin and all of that, and you keep putting them in places that you know they're going to fall in or they're not going to even hear you or try to obey you in by the Spirit of God. So Lamentations 3 and 32 tells us, I'm reading in the CSV version, he says, even if he causes suffering, he will show compassion according to his abundant faithful love. For he does not enjoy bringing affliction or suffering on mankind. But what he does do, he does prune and shape us. And some things we got to be buffeted in to be able to come up stronger and to do better. Then concept number three for equipping in this lesson is weaken the power that future conflicts and criticism will have over you, okay? you got to weaken that power. you got to come up against it. So as a believer and as a leader, we got to acknowledge who we are. And then uh, uh, who you are, that is, to this individual, you know, and then realize a person indwelt by the Holy Spirit is what God is flowing through you. And as a child of God, then you believe that God is moving you to do a thing and to go, go with this vision that way. So you are determined that the Holy Spirit will control your words, your actions, you know, and every deed that you do, no matter what people throw at you. You know, they call me, and there's one apostle that I thought I was so cute, she called me Dr. Mercy. She said what my name should be, Dr. Mercy, not Murphy. And the reason why I, I give mercy because I've been given much mercy and grace. And so God will gauge that. I don't control that. Some people that's working on my nerve even now, I believe that the graces of God and the love that I have, that I see them through the eyes of God. And so I pray for them. I don't push them down. I pray for them. And we need to understand that we too fall. We too are frail, okay? Daniel 4, I'm, only, I'm Daniel 6, that is. I'm only reading part of it. He says, but they could find no charge. Okay, our corruption, but he was trustworthy, and no negligence or corruption was found in him. We need to make sure as we determine our actions, okay, we need to weaken these future hits that may be coming to us, all right? So we need to weaken the power that future conflict and criticism will have over you, and Holy Spirit will show you as a believer how to deliver that because the Holy Spirit is in you. Concept number four for this equipment in this lesson, you want to build up people for their own future challenges and conflicts. This is the reason why we flow in different types of realms that God wants to kick in for those he has put to our hands. And so many of us who stand with coaches and trying to be counselors, God is not moving you, and as you say, he calls you a coach. You are not a counselor. We need to make sure that people be in the perspective and that you ask God to flow in you as a pastor, as a teacher, as a leader in the fivefold, 
are those who are building or creating disciples, even without a title. You don't need that to be a disciple soul winner. We need to make sure that we understand that we do need leadership, though, to grow us and to shape us, to make sure that we're not shaping the matter that is perverted. We want to make sure that we're looking at the fruit. So you want to build up your people for their own future challenges and conflicts. That means you want to watch them. When they don't know you're looking, okay, that means you want to show them gratitude where they need to get the gratitude and grace of appreciation, you know, because many of them think that they've always served and never got no recognition anyway, and they weren't looking for none. And so you need to surprise them when you know that they're doing a good job. You know, I never in my life have people, that seen people that have people work for them for years. They won't even go and visit them at the hospital. They won't even give them a, a certificate or anything, a piece of paper, something to show that they have been appreciated. I don't understand that. I really don't. You know, the first uh, volunteer meeting that I had to show my appreciation, the people were floored. You know, people that have been serving me for years, they know I would always do something for them. But when each time, each year, it got greater and greater, those type of celebrations of them serving me, it got greater because they became greater. So you want to understand that these things that we do is not on our own, all right? So when watch when they don't know you're looking. And when you discover moments of character that is fruitful, you want to praise them, you know, for everything and who they are and for what they did. I think it's very important that we look at that, okay? And so this uh, next part that I want to get to, which is very important, I want you to look at Luke 16 and 10 that says when we have these uh, times of conflict, we want to make sure that the character that you're nurturing that person through wherever they are to come more fruitful and to become uh, in the base of what God is showing you in your leadership. You want to make sure that it says that whoever is faithful in a very little is so faithful in much, and whoever is righteous in every, I'm sorry, in very little is also unfruitful in much. So we want to make sure whoever is unrighteous in this very little that God wants to make sure that we get them to come up in the fruit of the Spirit that He has put to our hands for those that we're raising up and discipling. Ooh, I know I am talking bad, so I'm trying to get off because you know y'all's attention span ain't nothing uh, in an hour attention span because I know mine is like that too. But anyway, so these are the keys that I want to close out with for this. I'm, I appreciate you listening to this. And please share this with some leader, uh, those who you know that are raising up people, whether they're a counselor, whether they are, you know, a mentor or whatever, a midwife, you know, those who are really, really passionate and leaders, we need to realize that we need each other, and we need those that God has put to our hands so that we can help shape them because God didn't send them for nothing. Many of them may wander off, you know, as a prodigal son or daughter, but they'll be back when God sent them back, and don't reject them. God don't reject us. Every and he's still giving us a chance to get it right. So here it is. Most leaders fall into two different types of camps of leadership. Either you, Number one, either you take conflict too seriously. Number two, two or you're not taking it serious enough. Both of these can be problematic. So let us unpack these types of leadership real fast so I can get you off of here, and I want you to decide which one that you might be working through now by, you know, by your leadership and where you need to make some adjustments. Okay, so here are four different things that are saying that you might be taking conflict too seriously. Okay, so and that means you there's uh, power, control, and, and Jezebelic, and you know, and all that. And some got Ahab leadership that just don't want to do nothing. But be, people wait on them. I want you to understand that God is holding us accountable to that soul that He has put in your hand. Number one, uh, these signs is that you feel like you failed because there is conflict. That's really not real. Real, you take it serious, too serious. Okay, don't let yourself think this way because, in fact, no one is ever upset about anything unless God is trying to show you something. You might not be moving forward strongly enough. Think about that. What am I doing? What do I need to say better? Number two, or do better. Number two, you need to take personal attacks. You, you, that is, you take personal attacks too personally. Just remember that conflicts are not usually about you. Even if someone tries to convince you otherwise, you need to realize that they may, that one is trying to convince you that they back by you. They may be the hater and the faker, the one that's delivering that. Please get my book, uh, 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 Deserting Undercover Sap Suckers, and consider getting the book of The Curse of Dishonor. I think God will open your eyes about a many thing to get you to understand that these attacks that we take, and I know I did. I mean, I talked about leadership that was my leaders, and I had to repent that thing so that Curse of Dishonor would be off of me and my ministry. Very important. So you want to not take personal attacks so personal. You know, just think about that. 
you just remember, these conflicts are not about you, as I said. You may feel like you're blamed for everything, but anyone who's a leader, we need to remember that we are already a target, simply because the devil don't like that you're raising up leaders, okay, that you're discipling. So be easy on yourself. Remember, it's not, it's not really personal. It's about your position as a leader. It's about your call. Amen? And so number three, you feel like it's your responsibility to fix all the things. You know, some things we need to remember that we just plant the seed, and, and, and we know that God is doing the water, but sometimes we want to plant the seed and do the water too. No, leave it alone. Let God do it. And in the time, remember that you can only take responsibility for yourself. Whatever you did or you didn't do, you need to take it to the altar with God so he can show you where maybe where you missed him at or that you went too ahead of him about or that you did not obey him about. So you can manage yourself first, okay? Manage these emotional triggers, especially intense conflict, you know, especially with those who are in leadership with you or that you put them in charge of some things, you know. So sometimes others have to be managed, uh, managed themselves, and that means let God do the watering. And then maybe you need to sit them down for a season. Or maybe you need to remove them from that particular job or, 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 or position that you have them in so you can see them in another light, okay? Number four. You allow the conflict to absorb all your time and energy. That's a big one. You do not want the conflict to absorb all your time and energy. And what I'm saying is that when it gets intense, it's hard not to be completely distracted. I know that feeling. When something is heavy on your heart, you, your energy has been sapped. That's why the, God gave me the name of that book, Deserting Undercover Sap Suckers. Uh, because your energy is just sapped from you. You're drained because you're giving out. So you, if you keep at least some focus on your own goals and your own spiritual support, remember I talk about self-care, visiting yourself. I just talked about that in one of my lessons here on this YouTube channel. You'll give the conflict less weight. That means you won't give it, you know, you won't keep feeding it. Like I always say, whatever you don't feed will soon die, okay? So you give it less weight in your soul, in your spirit, you know, that you can rest at night. This will be better for you and the ministry because now your business is, your business is coming up better. You're not focusing on what they're trying to do. You're focusing on what God is saying to you. Those are the four that you might be taking the conflict too seriously. Number, uh, the next set I want to give you is for a warning sign that you might not be taking the conflict serious enough, okay? And so I want to give you this because this is why a lot of them are falling because they're not taking it serious that this guy that's on this organ, you see that he is dating someone right here in the church. You see that this conflict is coming from the head uh, that you know that you really want to do with it, but you don't want to lose the pianist or the organist. You don't want to lose your, you know, the head leadership that's helping you, you know, the co-pastor or whatever you want to call it, the associate pastor or the, the children youth ministry leader. You don't want to leave, let that be tainted or moved away from, but yet you're allowing this sin to filter through the church or issues of conflict is coming from many of the elders, and we don't want to leave them out because they're doing a whole bunch of stuff too, but we need to make sure that we do the check. Make sure that you think about these warning signs that God is showing you that these conflicts are there to shape, to uh, remove the dross, remove the thing, remove the residue that's causing the ministry to be delayed or held up in these sinful, perverted acts that we make allegiance with, sometimes consciously or unconsciously. So number one, when you think that setting a strong limit with someone is mean or at least that they will think you are mean, okay, or that the situation that you're asking them to do is mean, or that you're trying to control them. So this is when you need to pay attention that you are have not been taking serious enough attention to. So in reality, it seems to be kinder to set limits with those who can't set them for themselves, you're going to have to let God use you to be able to discipline that person because that soul or that blood will be on your hand, and then that blood guiltiness is hard to shake. So you want to make sure that this can be expressed in love and make sure they understand. Number two, you think if you're ignoring it, the conflict will go away. That's what many of the churches are in today. You know, they're ignoring the sin. They're ignoring the fact that you're baptizing people who are clearly shacking up and doing these things who have not completely turned their lives around. You know, you're doing this, and, and, and God is watching over this thing, God is able to do anything in a quickness because he's that kind of God. He's a, he's, a, he's a sovereign. He's a God that can see all and know all before we can even begin to speak a thing. But one thing he does is he holds us accountable. So if you ignore the thing, 
that you just think it's just going to go away, they're going to get better as you preach. No, we need to understand that some things are going to have to be discussed because people have been bent. That's what that word means when they're talking about iniquity. This iniquity has been bent in their soulless realm, and somebody who is a midwife, the pastor, the leader, who you know is there, will gently, you know, seek God to how to address it. And so without this kind of upset or this hiccup, this can be very, very true, whatever it is, you know, that's going on. But if you're going to be uh, passive and ignore this person or this situation that you have no boundaries with that God wants you to do, they will just become more uh, invasive. They'll become more intense. And then there you go. The church will start to dwindle down. You can't get people to come back because they see that you're not strong enough in this place to get things straight so they can be in a fruit, you know, fruitful, growing, uh, you know, Bible-based church where the leader is in charge and not uh, people who have tithing or money or things that they give them uh, or service that they want them to continue to do these things because they don't want to lose them. Number three, you see it as one time. You see it as a one-time matter, unrelated to anything else in the past or present. You only see it just a one-time thing. So uh, now you're not taking it serious. So instead, you need to ask questions. You know, why now? Well, God show me what? You know, or why are you asking the question, why now? You need to be talking to God to show you what to do about these warning signs that you are naked, not taking it serious. So sometimes these conflicts will pop up in one area that doesn't seem related to the other in the ministry, but the connection may become more apparent uh, you know, as you begin to take some more analysis in prayer and fasting. God will show you where the bad seed is, where the hater and the faker is, where the Jezebel or where the Ahab or where this Leviathan spirit has come in and trying to usurp authority or come against the leader. We need to pray that God will show us, as Titus has shown us in chapter 3, how to deal with these people who are usurping authority, who are doing foolishness, and who they're striving against what God is trying to, you know, pushing and pressing against what God is trying to get you to do. You know, many of us are held up because we won't deal with the matter that you already see. God has let you see this enemy has popped his head up. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to slay the dragon? Or are you just going to look at him and say, I'm going to deal with you like the devil is alive. We need to be dealing with the devil right then. And the only way you're going to be able to deal with that is to go in prayer quickly. So some things you got to, how they say, you got to be on your feet and think fast. As tight as well. You know, he know what to do. He was a man of making sure he have organization and delivery to get a thing done. Because he rested in that power and authority. Okay. Number four. Okay, you want to think if you accommodate, I'm sorry, you think if you accommodate the difficult people, it will resolve the problem. Okay, typically they simply push the boundary further and they ask for more, and that is true. You know, you give them a little bit of rope, they want to hang themselves because you still trust that they can get better when actually they never got any help for the first situation. So you think that you can accommodate them by getting with them and spending time with them when really you are not a counselor and you haven't dealt with these things that you know that are perverted in their soul Ram, that they need to get it so the Spirit of God can flow through them in the right way, in righteousness, so the church can grow and go. Lord have mercy. I know there's conflict in every church. I know there's conflict in marriages. But I believe that in this vision that God has given you, He wants you to spread the word. He wants you to edify the body. He wants you to encourage them. He wants you to impart bonus, just God, to those that you are leading, those who are serving around you. Because why? It's going to spill over. Not, o- not only does it take fire in the church, it spills over and goes to the houses because every household is the church. Lord, help me today. So I invite you to follow me. I'm getting off here. I praise God and trust him that the goals that I uh, initially did in these five uh, struggles, that you have taken notes for these, and those that are listening to this will be able to get their uh, best practices uh, CEUs uh, for this lesson. So uh, if you listen to it, please write it down. It's one hour of credit so that you can log that on your ELST clergy best practices log, and I pray that God will bless you in what you have heard, and that your goals will go higher, and everything that he has for you, you'll be reminded, as I said earlier on, that you have to want this rose, you want to have this crown of glory, so he who, he who wants a rose must respect the thorn.
Amen. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, for every thorn. We thank you, Father, for every test. We know that you are the way maker. You are the healer. You are the deliverer. And so we thank you that you've already put the warring angel Michael on assignment for every hindering spirit, everyone that come against the work and the call of the ministry or the business that you appoint to your believers of this body of Christ for kingdom building in the name of Jesus. We know that it is for your glory. So we pray, God, that you hear us and you answer us. Because you said in Jeremiah 29, 9, 12 through 14, you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me, and when you seek me, I will be with you. I will hear you. I am with all your heart desire, and I will be found by you, declares the Lord, in the name of Jesus. And I decree that you will obey God, that you will not be afraid to change things, to go forward, to be bold, to build kingdom for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, remember... To be forewarned is to be forearmed. God bless you. Please share this message. Please, please, please. We got so many churches that need to be built up and be disciple. I mean, have the discipleship anointed so that we can build kingdom. God bless.